Hi guys, Mr. Howard here for you. We're going to be diving into our final topic of Unit 4. So make sure as we're going through this, you look at your study guide and at the end use that check for understanding um, to see if you kind of pick up on the key things that we want you to know. So we're going to talk about imperialism. And imperialism can come in many different phases. Um, one of them we're going to see is called economic imperialism. And it's kind of what we see in Latin America where different European companies and countries are going to kind of pressure native populations um, in the Americas to grow certain crops and kind of force them to, you know, provide those economic raw materials. Um, we're also going to see uh, kind of more of the old school colonization we're going to review and also uh, kind of the traditional empire building of certain countries having colonies. Um, we're going to focus on the Americas, Africa, and Asia. So the main thing to think about is kind of how is this fitting in the story. So we've talked in this unit about the Industrial Revolution and we're going to see how that to encourage this new wave of imperialism. Uh, and we're gonna see um, how this is gonna impact what's going on in Africa, in Asia, and in the Americas. So, kind of where are we at in world history? Well, remember the Industrial Revolution comes after um, and into the early part of, um, or sorry, the Industrial Revolution is after uh, that first wave of the Age of Exploration. So when we see the 13 American colonies and the Spanish Empire taking over the Aztec, all that happens, you know, from the 1500s to the, you know, 1600s. And then in the 1770s, 1830s, we're going to see those independence movements. Again, a lot of it's in, encouraged by enlightenment, like the United States, like Haiti. But then a lot of it also inspired um, by nationalism, like what we see going on in Mexico and in Latin America. Now, that's taking place again, 1770s or so to the 1830s. It's kind of really fortunate timing for the people in the Americas um, because that's the first wave of the Industrial Revolution. So like the textile mills are getting going and the economies of Britain and France are going to start growing, but it's not going to get to the new wave of technology that can be translated to military technology like railroads and machine guns. We're not there yet. And that really gives the people in the Americas an advantage. Had they waited much longer, these European militaries with the new industrial technology, probably too powerful to overthrow. Um, so it's important to think about, though, as the Industrial Revolution is continuing, more and more resources are needed um, for, uh, the, you know, for these factories in Europe in particular. So the new focus of the new wave of imperialism as opposed to earlier colonization the earlier colonization was you know we're going to send you know settlers and we're going to try and build the population there going to get rid of the native population too but we're going to um, kind of build these settlements kind of have this long lasting transfer of you know migrants it's not really the goal when we get into this wave of imperialism now it's more about use the people that are there extract as many raw materials as possible don't worry about anything else the in addition to getting raw materials, it's going to be a place that they can sell um, their goods to. So more markets uh, to export from Europe, back to Africa, to Asia, and then somewhat to the Americas. So with the Americas kind of out of play after those nationalist movements, the next kind of place Europe's going to look to expand into is going to be Africa. Very close to Europe, already had a bit of a trading post network. Um, so there kind of becomes this scramble for Africa is what it's referred to as. Now, the people involved in partitioning Africa are Europeans. It's not, and the Ottomans, who are kind of, you know, the Turks and from the Middle East. It's not the people in Africa that are going to be involved. Now, from a European standpoint, this is coming after Napoleon has, like, conquered half of Europe. And the new kind of thinking in Europe um, during the 1800s is we need to make sure there's not one country in Europe that's more powerful than the others. We had a problem when France got too powerful. So let's try and divvy up everything equally so that no one country is more powerful than the others. So we want to keep that balance. So they're going to try and divide up the resources in the land equally. You want to get raw materials. So figure out where the raw materials are at, not where the people are at. Again, it's just about raw materials and a place to sell those manufactured goods to. Both of those being connections to the Industrial Revolution. That's why we got them highlighted there. So Africa is going to get drunk, partitioned up be equal without any regard um, to like the natural boundaries like deserts and rivers and forests and certainly not with any regard to the people that were living there these different ethnic groups that are living there what's interesting is you know this is coming after the new wave of nationalism that led to the unification of germany led to the unification of italy led to independence in latin america so we know from last topic lashes is a big deal 
Well, this is the exact opposite of nationalism for the African people. They're not going to be able to choose their own borders. They're not going to be able to choose who's running their government and who they're grouped in a country with. This creates some long-lasting problems. As you can kind of see, the map on the left is, you know, if you were going to make boundaries based on those natural and ethnic borders. Um, but you can see to the right here, uh, we've got um, the borders that were actually drawn. And if you are in this kind of dark red, that means the people that are like you got divided into different countries. Um, so big, big issues um, there. And it's led to a lot of problems. Um, eventually, the African countries are going to get their independence, but they're going to keep the colonial borders. Um, and it was kind of part of them becoming independent. That was that they would keep those. And so these ethnic groups that, have, you know, literally thousands of years of conflict are um, in the same country. There. And likewise, they want to be, you know, if your ethnic group has been divided into other countries, you want to kind of make another country and then at least a conflict and war over territory stuff. Lots of civil wars, lots of we're talking about millions of lives that are going to be lost because of what's decided at the Berlin Conference in 1885. Um, we're still living with the legacy of these decisions today. Um, the European countries are only caring about exploiting resources and thus they don't invest in teaching um, the African governments how to do self-government. There's not an investment in infrastructure. There's not investment in manufacturing to help them modernize or industrialize. This is what's left Africa behind on the global scene. And it didn't have to be this way. The European decisions back then had a really, really negative consequence. We're going to look at uh, one of those places, which is today known as the Democratic Republic of Congo. Back then it was known as the Belgian Congo because the king of Belgium owned it as his own private colony. Um, and the Belgian king is going to argue, like most of the European countries, that we are helping to civilize the African people. We're helping them. We're going to help them modernize. We're going to teach them civilization and give them technology. But they don't do that. The only focus is on exploiting resources. They don't invest in education. They don't invest in self-governments. They don't improve infrastructure. Um, it's all about getting the raw material. In particular, it was rubber. And to um, get the rubber, they would set a quota for a local village, and the local village was forced to... Uh, meet the quota. And you can see in the picture on the right what would happen if they didn't meet quota. So they tortured these people, killed the local populations, and created slaves of many of them. So very, very negative effects. Um, and the borders that the Belgian Congo was left with, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, well, in 1998 to 2008, so very recently, there's a 10 year conflict where probably 5 million people died because of what happened during this time period. So Africa is really, really harmed um, by this. We're going to shift gears now. We're going to move into what's going on in Asia. And so for some context of what's going on in Asia, China and India, remember, where these explorers like Christopher Columbus and Magellan and all of them wanted to get to. China, prior to the Industrial Revolution, is the dominant economic powerhouse in East Asia and really one of the biggest powers in the world. China had ventured out a little bit and saw they were kind of ahead of the rest of the world. And regrettably for them, uh, they're going to essentially self-isolate and say, we don't need the rest of the world. Let's just focus on us. Japan's going to do a similar thing where they kind of self-isolate, cut themselves off from the rest of the world. Well, while they do that, there is progress made in, in China. Um, the Ming Dynasty do some really cool stuff. In Japan, it's going to become unified under the Daimo and the bureaucracy of the samurai is very, very efficient. So there are good things, but there's not the industrialization. There's not the development of new technology. There's not the development of new military technology. And that's going to allow the United States, which is now going to become a power, and the Western European powers and the Russians to pass the Japanese and the Chinese by. And it's going to be a kind of a big uh, shift. Remember, part of that is that we've got... Um, the age of exploration uh, led to um, this new power for Europe. So the time period we're getting into for China is known as the century of humiliations. They're going to lose a couple wars. Um, they're going to lose a lot of their economic independence. And a long story short, uh, eventually the British and the Europeans and the Americans, they want to trade with China. But again, China's been making some improvements. There's nothing the Europeans were making that the Chinese wanted. And again, one of the ideas here with the Industrial Revolution was that we could have more markets to sell to. Well, for a market to work, they have to have stuff that you want. And China didn't want any European stuff. So 
the British in particular, followed by the French, are going to say, well, you don't want our stuff, we're going to sell you drugs. The British Empire is going to go to war with China in order to force China to let them to sell drugs. Okay, This is like a gangland warfare to control a part of a block or something. It is absurd. Um, and China is going to lose that war because they don't have the military technology. And China is going to get divided up into these what we call spheres of influence, where essentially the Chinese government doesn't have much power. Now this part of China is pretty much run by the British, and this part's run by the Japanese, and this part's run by um, the French, and this part's run by the Germans. And so this is going to lead to eventually the end of the dynasty system in China, um, and they're going to lead to kind of what we see in modern China today. But it's a long and hard uh, century for the Chinese. And we can kind of see the carving up of China here. So, again, Europe's able to do this because of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, they've got the steamboats, they've got the steam locomotive, so now they can, you know, get more involved in some inland stuff that they before wouldn't have. There's new medicine and vaccines that are going to help them not get sick, whereas before, like, malaria and stuff kind of kept um, the European militaries from, you know, much inland incursion into Africa or India. New technologies, again, a game changer. So, and then let's think, okay, so why are the Europeans doing this? A lot of things. We've talked about the Industrial Revolution. Those are those economic reasons. You need the raw materials. You need to be able to sell uh, to these markets. You've also got this growing sense of nationalism in Europe. And again, they're taking away nationalism from these colonies, but they're inspired by nationalism. Our country's so great. We should be taking over more of the world. We feel proud to have more colonies. We're helping these people because we're so awesome. And another unfortunate element of this is also racism. Again, this idea that us white Europeans and later us white United States of America, we have this obligation to go and help the not white parts of the world and um, advance. And again, it's important to recognize that you ain't teaching civilizing when you're cutting people's arms off. And you're not teaching civilization when you're not investing in education. So the, the espoused values of these European and later the United States are not matching um, what's going on uh, on the ground. For the United States, uh, a lot of their expansion, this is the same time as westward expansion where you're taking over land from the Native Americans. An argument was made, well, the white American is doing more for us than the Native American can, so it's a good thing. Of course, this is very steeped in racism. So another Asian power was Japan, but Japan was behind China. Um, and Japan is actually going to kind of where it's the century of humiliation for China. This is going to be the um, Japanese miracle. Japan had looked at China as this mean big brother. And they see China just got beat up. And they're like, whoa, that is a huge wake-up call. We got to get our act together. So they're going to modernize and they're going to westernize their military. They're going to have massive investment from the government. They're really going to try and take on a more modern military. So the samurai are going to go away. Uh, huge investment in it becoming industrialized. And what's crazy is within 50 years of Japan being so far behind that they had to sign this really humiliating treaty with the United States, within 50 years they're going to be able to beat up their old big brother China, and they're going to beat Russia in a war, and then 50 years later they're going to be feeling good enough to take on the British and the U.S. in World War II, and they're going to have the upper hand for a while. So this is an incredible advancement in 50 years that Japan's going to make um, that kind of sets them up as the new Asian power. Now, there's going to be a lot of dark sides we're going to see when we get to the World Wars even about um, Japan when they start taking over parts of Asia. So let's kind of leave it there and kind of just recapping. If there's one thing to think about, we've got this imperialism, which is a country taking over political and economic domination of another. We're going to have this raw material extraction and these so that we can have more goods that we produce and a place to sell them. The Western powers in the United States are going to become more powerful over Africa, and then for a time, Asia, but we are going to see China and Japan become more powerful in the future. Big negative long-lasting impacts on Africa because of the lack of investment and the artificial borders. Japan's going to become a global power. The United States is becoming a power. And this conflict over imperialism, who gets which colony, is going to set some other groundwork for World War One, which we'll see when we get to Unit uh, 5. So we're going to leave it there, guys.